geometric view, it should be that this area, this square remains the same. We are just pixelizing it with smaller pixels. So actually for us, the pixel size will not be the same. Actually, we should think that maybe this is a unit square. So uh, this coordinate from 0 to 1 and this coordinate from 0 to 1. So then actually the pixel length for us would be 1 over 32. And in the other model, 1 over 64. So there will be a need to counteract this discrepancy. Yep. But, so we will look at this process. We will build the matrix. And so we will build a matrix that looks kind of like this. Actually, we will do it for different collections of, of projection directions. We take more or less projections because in an interesting way, the tomography problem becomes more difficult when we have fewer directions of x-rays. So we'll try a couple of uh, collections of, of directions. And for all of them, we will compute the singular value decomposition and take a look how the singular values behave. Mm -hmm. So for this particular matrix, you see, we have the hallmark of ill-posedness. The singular values are kind of smoothly dropping to zero in a logarithmic scale, never really dropping exactly to zero. So there is no kernel for the matrix. The matrix is invertible because even the smallest singular value is positive. However, you see the behavior like this. So um, recovering f from m when the measurement matrix is like this will be very unstable numerically. But we'll build up such a matrix model and we'll simulate some data with inverse crime and then we will try uh, truncated singular value decomposition and see how it looks like. Any questions at this point before going to MATLAB coding? Yep. Just about this uh, left and yes. side. There's some lines. Do you maybe like the length? Oh, excellent. Yes. So this here, uh, if we compare to the, oh, ah, so many, sorry. Ah, oh, this is not the most useful. Ah, ah, come on, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so now, when we build this matrix, yeah. the corresponding picture with the blue dots would be, would be uh, a square that would have a white uh, entry for each zero and a blue dot for anything not zero. So the corresponding picture for this matrix would have blue dots wherever there is something else than zero. So when we look at, oh, oh, well, at least you will, you know this process quite well. Oh, how many did I do? Okay, not too many. So here, if we think about the size of this matrix, so our, our unknown is 32 by 32. So F uh, is a vector in, in R, 1024, because there are 1024 pixels in the discretized F. Uh, this is the number of data points, the number of columns in the matrix A. So we have uh, 1911 actually coming from the Radon process of, of MATLABs. Uh, it's, it's the number of rays in one projection times the amount of angles we use. So that's the size of the matrix. And there are plenty of blue dots. These are actually not lines. They are blue dots very close to each other. So actually, this is a picture with white pixels and blue pixels. There are no lines. It's just because of the geometric formation of the matrix, some of the non-zero elements in the matrix are close by. So that's how to read this picture. So the, sorry, the columns are along this line. So actually, the picture should have been flipped. If you're saying the columns are from 1 to 1911? Oh, so, so the rows. No, this is, this is the right way. So yeah. uh, we have m equals af. Mm -hmm. And f 
is a 32 by 32 pixel image. So F has 1024 elements. So this matrix has 1024 columns. So it's multiplying a vector that has 1024 elements. And the result of the multiplication will have as many components as there are rows in this matrix. And that's the size of the measurement M. So the M vector has 19, 11 entries, and the F unknown has 1,024 entries. Yep. Yeah, what are the similar values if you increase size of the matrix? Excellent question. Let's see using MATLAB. It's, uh, well, I can say the thing is that um, the thing is that uh, in the continuum model with the A beautiful and F beautiful, it's also possible to define such a singular value development for the, the operator acting on function spaces, although then everything is infinite dimensional. So there's an infinite number of singular values. And their ill posedness shows up such as the limit of the singular values when, it, when we go to infinity uh, will be zero. In the finite dimensional case, so our matrix A is just approximating the operator A beautiful. The thing is, uh, the better and better we approximate A beautiful by increasing the dimension of F. We can divide our square to smaller and smaller pixels, so many and more and more pixels. So then there will be more and more columns in the matrix and the approximation to a beautiful operator becomes better and better. So then it just happens that uh, the singular values will get closer and closer to zero all the time when we make it bigger. Because at, at the limit, what it tries to approximate the A beautiful, its infinite sequence of singular values has limit zero. <laughs> That's what I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. And when we make it finer, we are not considering, so this will not change. Because we are considering uh, a finite measurement. We have a finite number of x-rays going through it. So this number will, will stay the same all the time because this is given by our measurement device. To change this one, we should change our data collection. But in the inverse problem, the data is given and fixed. It came from the machine, and the machine had a certain geometry, and that's reflected in this number. So this will stay the same, but we have the freedom of making F more detailed by having more and more pixels in F. So then we would have more and more columns in this matrix, and the singular values, they would have kind of a similar thing going, going gradually smaller like this, but they were at, at every time they would reach a smaller minimum. And so the measurement is also getting smaller or bigger? Yeah, the, the condition number of the matrix, which is uh, the first singular value divided by the last one, yeah. it will become bigger and bigger, it will blow up to infinity when we approximate better and better. This is actually a very crucial point uh, when we look at uh, Adamart's definition of, of ill-posed problems, because there is, there is uh, existence, uniqueness, and stability. And for matrices, we will see later in the course, uh, existence and uniqueness are very easy to analyze for matrices. They are really discrete things, just counting some dimensions, what's going on in the matrix. But the stability thing for matrices is kind of it is the condition, is the condition number big or not big? That's the stability, but what is big and what is not big? I mean, that's not a well-defined thing. So to really define that well needs exactly this question you asked. We have to think about the, the infinite dimensional operator A beautiful, and we need to think about a sequence of matrices approximating better and better. And then the condition number, if, if that blows to, up to infinity when we approximate better, then the problem is ill-posed. But then at some point, if you take bigger, bigger matrices, it's actually the solution gets probably worse. So is there some op optimal uh, amount of N and K? Yeah. The thing is that um, there will usually be uh, 
kind of a fixed amount of good information described by these large singular values. And typically, kind of the, the amount of good information stays rather the same even when you approximate finer, because that's somehow the information content of the measurement. We'll see. It's, it's not, uh, maybe this is a little bit imprecise what I just said, but it's, it's anyway something like this. The measurement only has so much information that it has. Uh, refining F doesn't help in that respect. But um, because solving ill post inverse problems is based on, on taking a priori information about the unknown, some other information than the measurement information, and combining these two informations. So we are looking for a way to express the a priori information mathematically in a discretization independent format so that we would have the same information represented more and more accurately when f is refined. In such a case, the balance should be quite okay. I mean, between measurement information and a priori information, uh, the balance between them uh, will not depend on the discretization of f if everything is done properly. So we can overcome that situation. Okay. Any more discussions? Okay, let's start coding our own little square phantom and uh, a couple of matrices A and see what happens.